Watch this. Maybe you'll get to hear Dave's answering machine. Hello? Hey, let's just do the phone. Okay, no problem. All right, we're live, by the way, so here we go. Okay. All right, we got Dave here, everybody, and Mike as well. And uh, new issue of The Observer is on the front page of WrestlingObserver.com right now. we got a lot of stories in there. And uh, the top story is about business for the Forbidden Door show, which ultimately appears to have done very well, Dave. What can you tell us? Yeah, I mean, um, it's really interesting to see because it was a very different audience, a lot more than most thought as compared to, like, uh, Double or Nothing. But it looks like it did about 127,000 buys on pay-per-view, which is not, not like, at, as high as the previous couple of shows have done. But it was a one-month build, um, you know, as, part, as, as far as that, and it was a new show. And, I mean, I think that most people considered that number well above expectations. So it was a good sign, you know. Um, very heavily U.S. based, um, not as much uh, European as the other shows, but I think a lot of that is uh, Sunday's tougher for Europeans because of the, uh, um, you know, it's it's like one to five a.m. or something during you know one to six a.m. you know one to five a.m. I believe. So on, a, on when, when there's work the next day, so it's tougher. You know, where Saturday you can justify it better, but um, in the United States Sunday's a better pay per view night. So. You know, and the United States is where the majority of the um, orders come from, so they're going to take precedence. So, so explain what you mean by a different audience from your normal AEW pay per view. More New Japan well, I, fan heavy. Yeah, I mean, I think some of it will be New Japan fans, but whatever it was, um, of the people who bought this pay per view, sixty-one uh, percent bought Double or Nothing, and thirty-nine percent did not. So it was. For 39%, they're not people who bought the previous show. I don't know. I haven't checked to see if they had bought other shows. But um, it was more. I, I had thought it would be more like the same audience. And while, you know, a lot of the audience is the same, um, a, lot of the, a lot more of the audience is different than I thought it would be. Dave, this may be a silly question, but I was kind of thinking leading into the pay-per-view, everybody, when it got to the pre-show, if you were going to buy this show, you were already sitting there tuned in and waiting to see it. I The way the thing built up, it didn't feel like there were going to be too many stragglers on the fence at the last minute. But do we know, and is it measurable, how many people ordered the show, you know, in the lead-up? And, and is that a, a number that we can find every, out? Every, every, Everybody buys the last minute, so it's like it doesn't really tell you anything. I mean, okay. I mean, I saw like like cable numbers like two days ahead, and you know, it's nobody. You know, because nobody buys on Thursday or Friday. Everyone buys on Sunday. You know, I mean, that's just how it is. So there's really no way to measure like the effect of you know a good pregame show versus you know and what that means. There's just no there's no way to know. So something we've actually not talked about at all on this particular show is uh, Rocky Johnson's six kids? Eight. Eight? Yeah. Eight, but five, five, new, five new Five ones. new children, yes. Everybody knew about Dwayne, and everybody knew about the two, the two kids from the first marriage. But there were, yeah, the rest were new. So, so what happened here? I, Tell the story. I, I, I don't know. I mean, um, what, what, what essentially I think happened is, is that um, some of them found out, and then they contacted... Um, Jay, who's Ricky Johnson is the name that most people know him, you know, Jay Bowles, um, who's Rocky's brother, who lives in Canada, and, and they, they're they all Canadian. So it just was one of those things where um, he, you know, they, they found him, some did DNA tests, and it's been, Greg Oliver has no is, is good friends with, with Ricky, so he's known about it and waited to do the story and interview the different people. It was really a fascinating it's a fascinating story. I had no clue over, you know, that, that any about any of this basically. So yeah. So so this is this is a group of children in Canada. Yes, in different parts of Canada. You know, depending on where Toronto, where he wrestled, you know, uh, Nova Scotia, where he wrestled and also grew up, and also Vancouver, where he worked before he came to Los Angeles and became a really big big star. Although he was a star in Vancouver too. So it was like the different places he worked before. Coming to uh, California, and that's where, he, that's where he met Atta, and, you know, and him and Atta were together, you know, for, for a long, long time, and then they split up later, too. But, um, yeah, Dwayne was like a, an only child, although he did have the, the two half-brothers that I'm sure he knew about, but I don't know if he knew about 
I don't know if he knew about the other ones. I, I'd never, you know, again, I, you know. But he, okay, I, so so these children were all conceived in places that he worked in Canada. Yes. But he also worked in a lot of other different places. Yes, but that was also after uh, Atta. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But, which is not to say that we're not going to find somebody else where I have no idea. Sure. You know. Yeah. But conceivably, yeah. there's there's Rock's got a lot more brothers and sisters potentially out there. You know, I would think so, just because the the idea that there's so many that we know about, and a lot of people don't get DNA tests and stuff. You know, because what happened is, is, is some of them just would, you know, they would, you know, they knew they didn't know who their father was. They got a DNA test, and all of a sudden it like said, "Oh, you got this half brother," because other people were taking DNA tests that were part of the family, and you know, um, and Ricky had a DNA test, so it led them to that. So if you were like adopted or something. And you, your mother never told you that it was a pro wrestler or didn't know her. And you looked like The Rock? <laughs> yeah, well, some of Isn't that what like one of the rock. kids said? It was like, uh, people said yeah. I look like The Rock. People kept yeah, saying. Yeah, a little bit like The Rock, yeah. yeah. But if you're, like, if you're one of the daughters, the daughters didn't really look like The Rock. The sure. daughters, you know. But, um, I mean, yeah, conceivably there could be more. Dave, you've had a good relationship and obviously have talked to Dwayne uh, a lot. There have been lots of uh, accusations. There's been lots of stories about his father over the years. Um, and now there is now this coming out, the autobiography, which was obviously a, a very controversial thing for several reasons, ended up being off the market. Does he reconcile this in the conversations you have with him? Is it just one of those things that he has to, obviously you got to shrug off and you keep going. He's got a lot going on in his life, but how does it affect him to your knowledge? And in the times you've spoken to him, how does he reconcile it? I can't really answer that fairly um, because I mean, I mean, I've talked to him and the subject comes up, but I've never had an in-depth discussion with him. I mean, obviously you can watch, the TV show, which is kind of like his vision, where I think I think that he loves his father in his own way, and at the same time is not, you know, he clearly knows his father was a con man and tries to make it, you know, and 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 made a lot of bad decisions. I mean, you you know, you watch the show and it's like Rocky Johnson isn't like portrayed like negatively, like he dislikes him, but you can see the heartbreak of certain things that Rocky Johnson did that weighed on him, you know, over you know, over his life, you know, looking when he looks back. All right. So uh, we got money in the bank tomorrow and it doesn't seem like there's a lot of interest except unless you're buying tickets. Well, I mean, the show sold out and and the secondary market's fairly strong, but yeah, I mean, I, I I mean, I guess there's, there's always the curiosity over who's going to win the two money in the bank matches, but you know, the rest of the show, yeah, there's nothing. I mean, it's not, it's not one of those shows that grabs you. But in the Vegas market, it's, uh, you know, it's doing okay. It, 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 you know, it is sold out. And um, without Roman Reigns, Brock Lesnar, you know, it's the top guys. And so, I mean, that's a feather in their cap, I guess. But, you know, which is the, the concept. Um, you know, I, I, I think that there's interest in who's going to win and then what happens from there. You know, maybe more on the women's side than the men's side, only because, you know, I think there's almost that feeling that nobody can win the men's title except for Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar, whereas the women's titles, you know that they can bounce around. Is it true that WWE is is determined to make Logan Paul a babyface? Oh, no. <laughs> um, I mean, we'll find out, but it's certainly, don't you think, from, from Raw on Monday where Miz cut the promo and everything? And I know ri- originally when Logan Paul came in, the deal wasn't that came from his side, not their side, that he had to be a babyface at the end. Like, he could come in as a heel, but when the story is over, he had to be a babyface. And, you know, every time they try to make him a babyface, it backfires. Look, he was in Cleveland, his hometown, talking about, I went to high school here, I was, you know, in the state wrestling meet. He did everything to get himself cheered in his hometown, and he got booed. So this guy, get you know, this is like a Floyd Mayweather. You know, if they really want to make him a babyface, it's going to be an uphill battle, and they'll probably at some point, like they did the other times, they'll probably have to give up. Dave, well, well, let me say one thing. Let me say one thing real quick. So they did do that on Monday, but I mean, if he were going to be a heel and team with Miz, you'd have to do that same promo if you're putting him back together after WrestleMania. Um, 
I suppose, but it sure, sure felt to me like he was going to work against the Miz. Yes. Um, you know, down maybe not right away, and maybe they'll do another split. But I certainly got the impression that is him against the Miz is is the the long term direction, um, and that would make him in theory a babyface. Although the last time him and Miz were you know had their little to do, everybody cheered the Miz, if you remember. Did Tyson Fury make a grandstand challenge to Jake Paul, or am I imagining this uh, in the last wasn't week or so? His, was, was, wasn't that just for his brother? Okay, was that what it was? For, okay. Yeah, it was, for, it was for Tommy Fury, yeah. Okay, that's okay. I was, I was wondering what no, was no, going no, on with all on, that I, sort of stuff. Tyson Fury and Jake Paul is the most ridiculous match in the history of the world. <laughs> well, I, mean, I was it, like, I'm trying to figure out how you can get that in a WWE ring. That sounds perfect. Oh, in a, w, in a WWE ring, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, um... <laughs> Maybe maybe after he fights his brother, maybe they can do that. Um, I think well, I think WWE would probably like to use um, Tyson Fury to get over one of their own, you know, one of their full timers, rather than just do pure celebrity. Although pure celebrity, probably at a WrestleMania, if you did that, would be wacky enough to where it would get an incredible amount of attention. And that match well, would get an it, incredible amount of. Attention. Well, actually, we got to head to a break. But thanks, Dave. We'll plug the Observer after the break. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Old Excalibur. We've got heat with him. <laughs> I was clearly joking when I said they sped up his voice. I had nothing to do with this, Mr. Caliber. <laughs> oh, now you have to apologize. His name is not Excalibur. His first yeah. name isn't Xavier. I like Excalibur. He used to be <laughs> yeah. a Caliber. If anything ever happens like AW goes under or whatever, you know they always have those those uh, those commercials about drugs, and they have that guy that reads the list of side effects. Yes. One out there, I, 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 it's... Potentially lethal taint fungus. <laughs> well, that would certainly be and bad. I am not exaggerating that at all. <laughs> My point is, is they, I they will were... never take this drug under any circumstances. <laughs> Potentially lethal taint fungus. Lol. <laughs> Lol. I hate him. If you enjoy these videos, for just $7.99 per month, you can enjoy full-length editions of The Brian and Vinny Show, Wrestling Observer Live, Figure Four Daily with Tom Lawler and Lance Storm, the Mad Men Podcast, Speak Now Pro Wrestling with Denise Salcedo and more, plus hundreds of archived shows, all in beautiful HD. Don't miss out. Join us today.